Schools have cut back on those classes and private lessons are pricey. But in Pleasant City, one community center has found a way. They couldn't get to everyone, but fortunately, those who didn't get in on this day won't have to do without. And it's not going to be easy for residents. This is the new normal, and they've just got to get used to it. Yoga is believed to have a calming effect on adults who practice it, and it apparently works on babies, too. They came from all over the state and across the country. Thank you all of you for being here with us. Welcome to our march. Hundreds of protesters, led by a nonprofit human rights organization called Coalition of Immokalee Workers, on a 10 day tour of several cities ending right here in South Florida. We came from the University of Notre Dame to support uh, immigrant farm workers. Their primary mission to get fast food giant Wendy's to sign the so called Fair Food Program aimed at stopping abuse of farm workers like unpaid overtime and dangerous conditions in the fields. They're also asking for an extra penny a pound for produce to be paid directly to farm workers like these. We're here to get Wendy's to pay a penny more for the people who are working in the fields. McDonald's, Burger King, Taco Bell and Subway have already signed on, but not Wendy's. Wendy's would rather pay Mexican farmers to grow their tomatoes in worse labor conditions than to pay local farmers and workers a fair wage. So after rallying in West Palm Beach, the group headed out, led by 87-year-old wheelchair-bound Ethel Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy's widow. We can hear it for Mrs. Ethel Kennedy. Yay! They walked past the convention center. Wendy. Through downtown West Palm Beach and across the Flagler Bridge. Boy, cut, Wendy. Winding up on ultra upscale Palm Beach Island, where Wendy's board chairman, billionaire Nelson Peltz, has a home, and where protesters were met by some local supporters. Wendy's a good deal of curiosity, incredulous stares, and occasional hostility. This is really sad. Come on, come on. Really come on. sad. And so it went down County Road to Swanky Worth Avenue, past exclusive shops and galleries. To a closing rally in a park along the Intracoastal. Organizers say they'd originally been denied a permit and had to sue the town of Palm Beach for permission to march here. It's not yet clear if they'll get the results they were hoping for. This is Cheryl Kahn reporting for WPB TV. Just about any stogie smoker will tell you there's nothing like a good Cuban cigar. Up until recently, they were very hard to come by in this country, although where there's a will, there's always been a way. Where do you get Cuban cigars? I have a friend of mine's a pilot. He brings them back. But since the U.S. lifted some of the restrictions on Cuban goods, cigar aficionados like these guys will be able to legally buy them and smoke them. It could become a very pricey habit. I think they're going to be very expensive. Okay. Of course, I think the demand is going to be much higher than the supply. That's what Johanny Nistal is counting on. He owns this cigar shop where customers come in to shoot the breeze and puff the day away. <laughs> Johanny is a Cuban immigrant who learned to roll cigars at a factory near his hometown. One of my relatives used to work in a cigar factory. So she remains to the cigar business. For the past several years, he's gone to a lot of trouble to bring his customers the closest legal thing to Cuban cigars. They're made at his factory in Nicaragua using tobacco grown from seeds that came from Cuba. Complicated, yes, but Johanny says it's been worth it, and he's not afraid of losing customers to Cuban imports. There's no way they can compete with uh, another country, Nicaragua and Dominican Republic, that they pay in between $5 to $8. Cuban cigar is going to cost over here between $25 and up. Johanny's regulars say they'll keep buying what he's selling because they like him and they love smoking cigars no matter where they come from. I think it's relaxing. I think there's a lot of camaraderie with cigar smokers. And while they do enjoy other kinds, some admit being intrigued by actual Cuban cigars. And so they say, don't be surprised if one day soon, through the haze, you see someone puffing away on a cigar that's clearly labeled Made in Cuba. This is Cheryl Kahn reporting for TV18. Churches like this one are considered by many to be the heart and soul of the community. And on the North End, Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church has played that role for more than 120 years. We have had to be so much 
for so many. Uh, because of our particular predicament as African Americans in America, uh, the church in the black community is more than just a worship center. It's a community action center, it's a social center, it's a political center. And it was put to good use during segregation when African Americans, especially in the South, were faced with so many obstacles. 73-year-old Gwen Ferguson is the church's executive assistant and Sunday school teacher. What words do they use in praise of God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ferguson says she remembers what it was like growing up around here during the 1940s when simply stepping outside the neighborhood could lead to tragedy. What I remember in crossing the boundaries, most of the time you would be, especially if it was at night, uh, you would be arrested for being in an area that you were so-called not supposed to be in. The first school for African American children was housed right here at Tabernacle. Later, during the 1960s, the church hosted prominent civil rights leaders like Coretta Scott King. Today, Tabernacle is a mosaic of old school tradition. Clap your hands, help me lift Jesus. Help me lift Jesus. Somebody help me now. Help me lift Jesus. And Generation Next. And on any given Sunday, they're still packing them in. It would be very difficult for me. Um, to attend another church other than Tabernacle. Um, I grew up in Tabernacle. Um, this is my church, it was my family church, and I just can't see where I would fit any place else other than here. And she's not alone. Y'all be tired, so move your feet. Sade McQuay is working towards her PhD at Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, but she comes back to West Palm Beach every chance she gets to help lead Tabernacle's young dance troupe. So I grew up dancing with Tahila from an itty bitty child around the age of six or eight. The girls she's teaching now range in age from 12 to 21. Their talent is used to convey spirituality. It's a dance trance, as we call it, to where we allow the music and the movement that we're doing to take over. Choreography like this also helps the dancers connect the dots between a deeply troubled past. Think like your grandma, your great grandma, whoever was the eldest in the family, eight is and up. And struggles that continue today. <laughs> and they're definitely counting their blessings that this church has come a long way surviving setbacks that seem to have made it stronger in the long run, rebuilding after a devastating hurricane. Constructing a brand new education center right across the street, trying to serve as a beacon of light for whoever needs it. It gives the community that peace, that you know there is somewhere here to turn when times do get hard. Hoping to be an inspiration for many years to come. This is Cheryl Kahn reporting for TV18. Bingo night at Roosters and just about every table and bar stool is taken. You ready to play bingo? Bingo! This is one of the few gay bars in West Palm Beach and one of the first places many gay tourists head to when they hit town. Go 65. And while gay friendly businesses like Roosters do help attract travelers to the area, there's a campaign underway to make West Palm Beach even more appealing. For us, genuine hospitality is for everyone, no matter your skin color or your sexual orientation. Some hotels have been courting gay travelers, offering romantic getaways to same-sex couples. Rick Rose, who's gay himself, is co-owner of Grandview Gardens Bed and Breakfast. All the rooms have outside private entrances. Rose says if you want repeat business from gay tourists, you've got to be on your toes. They're uh, choosier, they're pickier, they're, they have an eye for aesthetics. And they try to go where they know they'll be treated well. I'm loving this breeze today. This is unbelievable. Matt Chambers and Will Davis were the first in town to become husband and husband on the very day same-sex marriage became legal in Florida, the mayor officiating at their wedding. I do. 
Matt and Will say when they travel, they try to do their homework ahead of time. So we do some research online. We look around for reviews from other gay couples or other people in the community and try to spend our money where they want our money. One way that message is getting out here is on the city's website, which lists contact information for the city's liaisons to the LGBT community. The city does recognize the importance of having diversity and equality and having a liaison to the, to the city sort of increases that comfort level. It's also important to let travelers know there's lots to do and see here, from a beautiful waterfront and lively downtown scene to events nearby like the Gay Polo League's championship tournament. Gay Polo League Tournament. What a wonderful event. Local female impersonator Melissa St. John went to the tournament with some friends. Welcome to Gay Polo. Melissa, who performs at Roosters, is also the bar's entertainment director, known in that role as Charles Capers. Charles remembers when, years ago, walking around town in drag could be dangerous. We were approached uh, by a group of men in a pickup truck with baseball bats. But that was then, and this is now. Capers and many others say they want gay tourists to know if they do come to visit, they'll have fun, they'll be safe, and they'll definitely be welcome. This is Cheryl Kahn reporting for WPB-TV.